issues and education continues. Here's your moderator, John Carney, on KTRS. I think that's a first. I, I was listening to the broadcast, and I thought, well, this is an interesting show. Moderator. Who's the He's got the same name. Oh, I'm the moderator. I've never been called that in my life. It is 1024. Of course, I had to come all the way down the Lake of the Ozarks to be called a moderator. Uh, we are at the Missouri School Board Association Annual Conference at Tantara, and it is the monthly Issues and Education Roundtable, heard on the Big 550 KTRS, brought to you by Hidner Architect. And even in our initial discussion, just scratching the surface, money, funding, all came up immediately. In this segment, we're going to talk about school finances. Helping us with that, uh, Larry Felton is still with us. So, Larry, thank you for uh, sticking around. Dr. Paul Ziegler uh, joins us, too, superintendent of the Northwest School District in Jefferson County, and also Terry Ward, who's a member of the board and has some key insight into TIFFs and all of those things that really none of us understand, except for him. So, (laughs) gentlemen, thank you for being a part of this. You're welcome. Money's always the first thing to come up, and when a budget's got to be righted by a government, they will go right to education. I work with an organization called Play It Forward, which puts instruments in the hands of school kids who... Otherwise, wouldn't have it. Music programs, first ones to get attacked. My daughter's performing art school has an annual budget of less than $1,000, and that's on the high end. So the lotteries came in, and they said, we're going to give all this money to education, and it's going to be fantastic. And there's still not enough money. I, I don't know what's happening. Terry, you want to help me with this? Sure, I'll be glad to. Uh, One of the things is, over the last few years, the state uh, legislature has had several years where the funding was flat, so there's no increase in funding coming from the state. As Melissa mentioned earlier, the funding is dependent on local funding, highly more, more dependent on local funding every year. And the thing that's been evolving over the last 10, 15 years is the use of tax increment financing and other tax abatements as a way to incent development, and the, uh, the hidden agenda that's not mentioned is most of the taxes that are either abated or diverted were intended to fund our schools, and, like 70%. And the way it's often spun with the TIF, it is to court a business, to come into a neighborhood, and it's going to provide jobs, and it's going to boost the economy. And that end you're talking about is something that's not often brought up. Now... Does the Board of Education or does anyone from the world of education have any say as to whether or not a TIF is available for a Walmart or some other development that's coming into their district? In a practical sense, no. On a TIF, there is a TIF commission. Two of the 11 members are there. Six of them come from the city. In a 353 or any other tax abatement, they are basically driven by the city. So the city is the one or the county that controls it. The school district's only voice is weak and what they can do in building relationships with local, other local elected officials so that they can have an influence, but the influence is by suasion, not by control. Larry Felton, who is a board member in Melville, a lot of this falls on you. The money just isn't there. So as a member of a functioning board in a school district, how do you approach that? What do you do? How do you spread it out farther well the problem you have is you have to do everything you can to maintain the classroom so you're faced with what do you cut outside the classroom and when your budget is 70 to 80 percent the cost of your professional educators and people to maintain your buildings it's very difficult i mean you're always salaries are the first thing you have to look at you have to look at transportation you have to you have to look at after school activities and, and as you mentioned, with, with music or athletics, there's always a, a very dynamic discussion you have to have with the community about that. Dr. Paul Ziegler is with us, superintendent in the Northwest. Let's talk about where the money does come from as opposed to just the money that isn't there, which we've kind of chronicled. So where do you go and get it? Bake sales probably isn't enough. No, unfortunately, we've had situation where almost across the state, Budgets have either remained flat 
or even decrease. Like our budget, uh, our 2008, uh, 2009 school year was actually $4 million higher than our budget is for this year. So for us, we've tried to manage that through cuts. And you can only manage through cuts for so long before that burden. We've cut over 120 staff members during that time period. We've cut some programs at risk, gifted, things like that. So we haven't really found more money. We've just managed through cuts. As a parent, and I will complain about it, but, you know, I'm, I'm buying the wrapping paper. I'm buying the tins of popcorn. I'm getting God knows what. And it's, it's constant. But... I do it for the school, and of course, if 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 the kid turns in twenty five bucks, he gets a plastic thing that's going to break, and it means the world to him. But in the grand scheme of things, when you've got all these kids doing this, does that amount to a fair amount of money? And maybe I should stop making fun of it as much as I do. Well, I think it it amounts to a fair amount of money to do extras. Typically, typically, that's try to increase technology in a school. Maybe buy another uh, laptop cart that that school could use or things like that. There are things that that supplement what we're doing as a school district to help us out. Or it may be for a field trip. Again, those have been things that have been cut over time. Very valuable learning experiences, but very expensive to transport kids and pay admissions and things. So a lot of times those fundraisers go to activities like that. Um, I want to break it down a little bit. We're going to get into early education a little bit later on. I would think, Larry, and and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure you'd all feel free to do so. Um, Is early education less expensive to a district than higher education? Well, it depends. In our case, we're able to get grants to take care of the majority of the costs in our early childhood program, which we don't have available at the elementary, middle school, and high school. And what happens to get those grants? Because often there are strings attached. With ours, we have to have a certain percentage of disabled children as part of the program. So I want to say our percentage is in the 40 50 percent range if you could break it down in that k through 12 area and any of you guys that want to chime in on this is there one particular segment that seems statewide to be the least funded for one reason or another or does it not break down like that it really doesn't break down like that if you're looking at k-12 education that funding comes 70 percent of it from the state and it goes to the school board to manage So the school board can apportion it any way they want to. 524 school districts across the state do it their own way. The idea of early childhood is basically adding another one to two years of education without funding to match that portion in any way, shape, or form. Dr. Paul, any thoughts on that? We we have a pretty robust early childhood education program. We use federal dollars through Title I to service some of our youngest. We use special education dollars for our students with disabilities. And then we also use some tuition-based programs on a sliding scale to help our parents that can't afford it. So realistically, our early childhood, we figure, costs the district about $10,000. I mentioned this in passing, uh, lottery money. And when they rolled that out before we voted on it, it was we are going to give $300 million to education, buy a lottery ticket, you're sending a child to school. And from my understanding later, uh, and many people's understanding is, yes, I'm just making up a number here. $30 million was given to the state earmarked for education. And the state said, well, we've got this extra $30 million, so we could take out $30 million that we had for education and we're going to spend it on something else. Is that how it's happened? Yes, it's supplemental. Why hasn't that changed? Because that seems almost illegal. Well, they're fulfilling their commitment of taking the proceeds and putting them all in education. The state legislature is the one who's made the decision to use it as supplemental. And it's not the lottery. I don't think they're the bad guys, right? I mean, isn't the they're, state the one that's earmarking and, and taking? Well, and It's a show game almost. Well, there's a, there are two halves to the story. The first one is that what they're giving to the state are the profits. And there is a huge chunk taken off the top that goes to support the processing of the lottery and so the amount going to the school districts is really only about 50 or 60 percent of what's coming in. With the money that you do have, and I don't want to paint just a bleak picture of education saying, oh, my God, there's no cash. I mean, there is money and things are functioning just fine. When you earmark what's going to go where, and as a superintendent, uh, Dr. Paul, if you want to handle this, 
how do you break down 20% goes to teachers, 18% goes to curriculum, upkeep on the building, something that also needs to be maintained for the safety of the kids, if nothing else? We try to take it on a year-by-year basis to address the needs that we see as most most needed for any given year. Um, unfortunately, oftentimes, some of those capital projects or the supplementary programs that are very important for our schools are the first ones to be cut. And for us, we've adjusted that and cut back on at-risk programming or gifted programming or things of that nature that aren't required by the state, but certainly are things that our kids need. Um, for us, we only allocate 50 cents per square foot of building for capital projects. And anybody knows that 50 cents in capital wow. projects per square foot is not much. And that's after last year we had allocated zero. Is that so. statewide, that, no. that number, or is that just in your district? School districts set that their, their own self based on their budget and what their needs are. So for us, that's the way we've managed those reductions, mostly in state funding. Our, our local funding has remained relatively flat. But over the years, we've watched that grow into a larger percentage of our budget because our state funding has decreased so much. Dr. Paul Ziegler, also Terry Ward is with us, and Larry Felton, too. It is our Issues in Education Roundtable discussion brought to you by Itner Architects and a great opportunity that we have because we are at the MSBA Annual Conference at Tantera. A lot of things left to cover. In fact, we will get into uh, standardized testing and it is confusing, and Common Core, I, I'm going to get an education. I'm sure you are as well. It's 1035. There's more to come on the Big 550 KTRS.